Father James Mitchell here today. We're going to be talking about NWA's upcoming pay-per-view on October 28th, NWA Sawen. People know your persona throughout the years, different promotions. You, it, It's very fitting that you're going to be hosting this event with NWA, but how much of a connection do you have with like Halloween or Sawen, the actual holiday itself did like what sort of knowledge did you have about this before nwa decided to use the name for its next event uh yeah you know i've always been something of a student of the occult going back to when i was a child so um i have been familiar with uh, the concept of sound since i was probably in i don't know fifth grade or something like that you know sound is the forerunner of what we modern era and uh in the united states called halloween mm -hmm. and essentially it was a time when um once a year it was uh celebrating the change of the seasons and it was a, an evening when they believed the veil between uh the living and the dead was opened and uh all of the dead would uh, the spirits would uh, walk the earth and engage in various forms of uh, mirth, merriment, and misbehavior. And uh, as we adapted it over the years, um, that's the reason that children dress up like uh, ghouls and goblins and walk around through the neighborhoods. So, yeah, I've been, uh, I was pretty, uh, I've known of it for a long time. And uh, I was surprised when they uh, brought it up as the name of the paper. Yeah. And I guess that's why I've been pegged as the... Uh, the uh, host and devil at large for it because I would be the go-to guy for that sort of thing. I think it's a very fitting role for you. Uh, I'll say my probably first recollection of it was in the Halloween movies. I don't like, I don't know if you're a fan of those too, but there was the whole thing with, it was mentioned, I think in Halloween too with Michael Myers. And then there's like the cult of thorn and all it, you know, you mentioned your, your knowledge of the occult, but did you watch any of those? And like, oh yeah, the Halloween movies. Yeah. yeah. Did Absolutely. you think it was an accurate representation of what it was supposed to be, or was it just? Um, it's you know every once something gets into Hollywood, it all it gets Hollywooded up. You know, <laughs> it's uh, but uh, you know, in, in a broad, uh, a broad thumbnail, I guess. Of course, if that, that's doesn't work with them that small mm -hmm. on spectrum for a uh, mass audience it was uh, explained well enough for the layman i want to talk more about your career too uh not just right now with nwa but overall you've right. been uh manager min sinister minister uh james vandenberg people have known you by some of the some of the names that you've been part part of their careers, you've been aligned with Abyss, Judas Macias, just to name a few. But right now, what's it like for you to spotlight a history maker for you know Max the Impaler is a non-binary competitor. They have done a great job establishing their own character. Now getting a chance to be women's television champion. What do you think about their run and just being a part of their career? Um, I, I think it's been tremendous and it's, uh, it's been history making. Um, Max also just recently won um, a title in Japan. And, and that makes uh, Max also the first non-binary uh, champion to ever hold a title in Japan as well. Um, I was, uh, I was really impressed with Max the first time I saw them, and uh, putting us together was, uh, was was a perfect combination. Um, I've always kind of specialized in not kind of manager you can just put with uh, a regular. Because uh, the the word I've gotten over the years is that I would overshadow them or chew up the screenery, or the scenery. So when you have um, a monster heel, uh, especially one who does not talk, it, it works much better. Um, you know, I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. 
Max reminds me in terms of their working style of um, of a young big band Vader. You know, and some of the, some of the other uh, big monster heels over the years. Uh, but really, really impressed with what Max is doing. And it's, uh, if anybody wants to go check it out, it's Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling Wrestle Princess for the event where Max won the title. I did right. want to also ask, and this is for the James Vandenberg era. I remember a lot of the blunt, the the glacier, the blood runs cold storyline. It was supposed like I don't know why I never got this until after the fact, but it was a spin off of the Mortal Kombat video game, and Glacier was Sub Zero, and Mortis was Reptile. There was Wrath was involved. You, you were also involved. Was there ever a, like was there ever a discussion about your character? being more like a character for one of those games or what what kind of knowledge did you have about the games before this whole thing was presented to all of you um i had zero um knowledge of video games i was only aware that there was a video game called or uh my understanding because they were in working on this for a year before I got involved with it. I mean, I, I was hearing all the secondary, secondhand information from Canyon, um, but that it was uh, designed to evoke the uh, Mortal Kombat kind of vibe and to catch the wave of the uh, rapidly emerging video game mm -hmm. uh, culture. So, yeah, it was pretty much definitely supposed to be a knockoff of Mortal Kombat. The idea was to draw in, you know, the uh the eight to fourteen year old demographic, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the usual adult uh demographic, which I think was what, 21 to 55 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Glacier was Sub Zero, Wrath was uh I'm sorry, Mortis was Reptile, the two characters from the game. Did they ever come to you specifically and say here's the character in the game that we want you to portray or did they let you just sort of put your own spin on it and the other characters were more specific? Um, no, I was not based on a video game character. Um, the deal was they didn't have a mouthpiece mm -hmm. and uh, none of them at the time were considered to be strong promos. So uh <laughs> They'd been looking for a manager. My understanding was that it had been pitched to Oliver Humperdinck at one point and possibly Gary Hart, and they weren't interested in it because it was so far out in left field. Mm -hmm. uh, and one night, um, I was at Canyon's house, and Dallas Page called him up and said, hey, get that manager guy that you know over here in the morning, uh, but go ahead and make me a tape. So I tried to, there was no story to Blood Runs Cold. There, mm -hmm. as far uh there was none so looking at these crazy characters i came up with a pitch that they were underground pit fighters from malaysia and taipei and like you know what's that movie blood sport stuff mm -hmm. like that um so i tried to put that kind of spin on it instead of them being uh monsters from outer space or whatever i don't even know what mortal Kombat is but uh we took it to page the next morning and he loved the pitch but he didn't like my delivery. He didn't like the, you know, the gimmick I was doing at the time, which was uh, Daryl Van Horn from Smoky Mountain Wrestling back in the day. So he basically painstakingly uh, directed an audition tape for me to take the Eric Bischoff, uh, which is what became the James Vandenberg character. So pretty much I took all of the elements that I had uh, recorded the night before, and he just had me change the delivery and the delivery Instead of being a fast talking manager, he said, You've got to be a character, bro. You got to be a character. So he came up, you know, with all of the hand wringing and the speaking, like, you know, mm -hmm. and a hiss and very slow, evil delivery and looking down my nose at the camera and all that. And uh, he took it. I was sitting in his man cave later that afternoon and he walked over to Eric Bischoff's house and, uh, came back and said, you got the job. So, uh, but 
by that time, uh, NWO had already taken off and they were basically not going to give us any promo time, really. I think maybe the whole time I was there, I did two promos. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were a back burner item at that point. You know, I don't know if you caught this earlier in audio before it crapped out, but Eric told me that gimmick was already the day he uh, signed me to the contract he said the gimmick's dead and it's not going to go anywhere so don't buy a house or get married or anything like that it's a hell of a way to come in but um you know it was a great featured spot i mean for, for that time to be on uh, the hottest cable tv show and the number one rated wrestling program at the time um it was a super super spot i mean we had that big production even though we didn't get promo time and 90% of the time, if we were in the ring uh, doing our thing, they were talking about the main angle with the NWO instead of calling the match, really, if you uh, recall the way they did things back then. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it was a life-changing experience, and uh, it's I, I always refer to it as kind of like going back and looking at your old uh, uh, middle school yearbook or something when you had coke bottle glasses and buck teeth or braces or something you know uh, it's part of what it's part of your journey that brought mm -hmm. you to where you you know eventually are now i saw another interview you did it's interesting that you brought up that role kind of floating between or almost going to another person i saw you said you almost managed jack swagger uh there that was they was, they what uh so they went with dutch zeb Coulter, right. but it it sounds like you knew you already knew it was a bad fit like at least you said that now well, did you did you know that now or would you have turned it down then if if they, it got that far they did not tell me who it was what i was told by the writer who contacted me uh, this was the second time he contacted me in the same year because the first time it's like, we can't tell you yet. And that turned out to be Tensai, who they didn't mm -hmm. put me with. And the second time, uh, the same thing. He said, we can't tell you what this is, but after SummerSlam or what, I forget what the date was. Um, he said, we've got a guy who needs a new coat of paint mm -hmm. and uh, he needs a mouthpiece. And so I waited and waited and waited. And I finally got a phone call. The guy said, I don't know if you watched so-and-so last night. And he goes, but uh, the guy we were going to put you with was Jack Swagger. And we put him with uh, Dutch Mantel instead. So I had no idea what the gimmick was going to be. And then uh, so when I saw what Dutch did with it, I wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, right. it, it just it wouldn't have been organic to me. So, it, I mean, if they'd offered me the gig, I would have tried, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, God knows what they would have. I'm sure they would have completely changed my appearance and the whole nine yards. But, you know, I honestly don't even if they hired me for that, I don't I don't think it would have worked because I think they would have changed me so much that it wouldn't have felt organic. And I thought Dutch did a hell of a job with it, you know. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you, you want opportunities like that, but then also you're sort of staying true to yourself in a way like you like you have your persona already created and people like still to this day like you see certain cameos you've done like i think it was the second or you've done it a few times where uh with rosemary and right havoc like you just open the door and it's like like it just works like you don't really need an explanation right and it's just like because you've built up that character over the years, even though it's been different names, different variations, but like changing that much, I, I think I agree with you. Like right away, I don't, I don't think it would have worked. I think maybe you could have given it a shot, but I think knowing that something's not the right fit, you know, I, I think there's a lot to say about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I said this in another interview, I think what you want to be, in wrestling is basically you want to be typecast you know mm -hmm. you know um you know I've, you know arnold schwarzenegger is still almost usually arnold schwarzenegger no matter what role he's playing um mm -hmm. uh john wayne was always john wayne even when he played genghis khan it was still john wayne you know mm -hmm. uh, clint eastwood same kind of thing um when you look there i mean there have been a lot of great journeyman wrestlers over the years that uh portray you know they did 
50 different gimmicks. You know, they did whatever it took from territory to territory, uh, change your names, completely change your characters, you know, and they kept the lights on and kept food on the table. But generally guys who did that were not, uh, they weren't people that became iconic really, you know? Um, and so like, even when you had somebody like Dusty Rhodes, when he went up uh, for the Vince Jr. run, you know, having previously been up there as the American dream, they brought him in and uh, made him the common man and they put the polka dots on him. Now he was still, and I'm, you know, I know he bristled at doing that, but he just said, Hey, I'm going to go ahead and dive in it. Cause this is the way the wind is changing. You know, you have to, you have to adapt and, and uh, evolve or you stagnate and stagnation leaves leads to extinction. But Dusty in that case was still basically able to be himself. You know, mm -hmm. but if they had made him uh, the mailman or something and said, uh, quit speaking with that lisp of yours and quit, you know, doing all the shuck and jive you do. Um, I don't I think that it wouldn't have worked. Um, you, you have to you have to have something of yourself um, to to present you basically the most successful characters in wrestling are people who take something from within themselves and they just turn it up to 40, you mm -hmm. know? And, and, uh, that's, that's really, I think the secret to anybody getting over and yeah, you, so you have to be true to yourself. I think Tensai is a good example of what not to do because you had Prince Albert, a train, he goes over to Japan and has a great career. But then they come back and it's like, oh, well, he was in Japan. Let's give him a Japanese name. And it's like, eh, like, eh, I don't know. Like, Yeah. I, I and just... with that one, you know, so they needed him out. And this was all explained to me after it was revealed to me who he was. Um, so I guess they put him with a Japanese guy. I forget his name, a mm -hmm. little guy. And I guess that was because uh, Tensai obviously did not speak Japanese, at least to my knowledge, you know, I'm sure, well, he should, would probably, sure he probably spoke a little bit if he worked over there so much, but probably wasn't convincing. So they put him with uh, the the small Japanese guy, um, I guess. So it had that touch of authenticity to it more so than Prince Albert with paint on his face, you know? So master of ceremonies at NWA saw when, you have your own role, but what else are you looking forward to? Like you get to see some of the upcoming talent that NWA has been working with. I didn't know this beforehand, but you've worked with uh violent J a little bit before the ICP. You did a recording for one of their albums. Yeah. Looking and, forward uh, to reconnecting with him. Yeah. I, I actually uh, saw him at the last couple of tapings. I had not seen him since, probably 2006 2007 so i believe i uh recorded the tracks uh the voiceover cameo for the song ride the tempest mm -hmm. um in late 2006 i think it came out in march of 2007 but uh yeah it was good to see him back um and he's working with the uh brothers of fun structure the clowns um so, uh, yeah, it's nice to have him around. And, you know, he, he is a big wrestling fan and a uh, positive, uh, positive presence backstage. Anything else you want to plug before we get out of here? And, and NWA saw when is October 28th. Anything else you have going on personally or anything um, you want to well, get? Well, you know what? Let me uh, run down the uh, card uh, as we have it so far. And then I have one bit of big breaking news before I go. Um, so, Salon, that will be October 28th in Cleveland, Ohio at Temple Live on the card. Thus far, we have the NWA Women's Tag Team Championship, Pretty Empowered, Ella Envy and Kylie Page versus Natalia Markova and Taylor Rising. We have the NWA Junior Heavyweight Championship, Colby Carino versus Joe Alonzo. We have an NWA Tag Team Championship Knights of the Round Table Tables Match. Blunt Frost, uh, excuse me, Blunt Force Trauma, Carnage and Damage, managed by Aaron Stevens versus Knox and Murdoch. Um, the NWA Women's Championship, Kinsey Page uh, versus Ruthie J. 
And then the NWA Heavyweight Championship, that would be EC3 versus Tom Latimer, who's using the lucky seven rule uh, that the uh, television champion is able to use to get a World Heavyweight Championship match. Anyway, tickets for that can be found at nwatix.com. The pay-per-view will be available on Fight TV. That's F-I-T-E, Fight TV. So uh, make plans to be here. Be there. It's going to be one hell of a match, one hell of a pay-per-view. And then the big breaking news, which I found out right before I got on the phone with you, uh, something I've been sitting on for months. Uh, Billy Corgan just announced uh, formally that we will be uh, on network television coming into 2024. Uh, we have two different TV contracts or uh, two different pieces of programming that will be airing on a top 20 uh, national network. Um, and I can't say any more than he said, because he said he has to leave it there. But I've been aware of this for months. A lot of stuff going on behind the scenes backstage. And it's going to be a banner year for NWA. So uh, the National Wrestling Alliance is going to be back on a national platform. And I implore everyone to tune in. Uh, currently, NWA uh, Power is on uh, YouTube at 6.05 on Tuesdays, but we will be leaving that, of course, to move on to our new network partner uh, early in 2024. Be sure to check out the product. It's a great product. Get your eyes on it. I think you'll love it. I caught a little bit of what he said. I agree with him that YouTube is not very kind to wrestling. It's everybody's numbers are down across the board. So I am glad to see that things are progressing. I know he's sort of talked about the next step for NWA's broadcast home for the past several months. So now that that's actually done, that's really great news for the company. Uh, I look forward to hearing more like whoever, whatever network that is, it, it'll be great to have that out in the open. And uh, thanks for your time today. I, I appreciate getting to do this. I'm glad we worked out all the technical kinks and I'm looking forward to the pay-per-view. Great. Thank you. Thank right. you for having me.